Matthew chapter 14. This is going to be one of those studies that take a while to get to the point. <laughs> so, so bear with me. There are various increments that we're going to be um, involved in as we get to the, the thing that I wanted to share with you, the exhortation and encouragement that we do find here in Matthew chapter 14. What we're looking at is where Jesus Christ is going to still a storm. And sometimes you may be thinking in terms of like, how is that practical to me? How often am I going to be on, on a, a, a literal body of water attempting to walk? And of course, we know that the miracles of Christ were intended to, to produce peop, within people the uh, ability to see that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, sent by God, and that his message was intended to be received because he validated his, his, his words by his works. He was confirmed amongst men by the signs and wonders that he performed. And so when you, when you read the Bible, you discover that there are various things that pointed to Christ as being the Savior. And you will see things re related to his words and his activities and, and witnesses that were given concerning him, witnesses of John the Baptist, witness of the Father, uh, witness of of uh, his miracles. And you see that when you read your Bible, and, and it's pretty clear to us. So sometimes when we're reading the Bible, we might come upon some fantastic thing like walking on water, and we ask ourselves, how does that really pertain to us? What is that really going to show us? And so as we go through this, I'm going to be laying the foundation for you fundamentally uh, for some time so that we can get a, a more full picture of the events that are taking place. I'm going to touch on some things that I think have practical application. But ultimately, at the conclusion, uh, I'm going to take you to a few things that might help us to understand uh, what the Lord would have us to learn today in this passage. So let's begin reading here in Matthew chapter 14 at verse 22. We're actually going to go and conclude at verse 36, but I'll take you to verse 33. So we begin at Matthew 14, verse 22. I read to verse 33. We'll get into our study. And we begin... With verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. And when evening had come, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, it is, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. And so let me give to you a couple of things to develop a context so we can flow into this passage. Because last time we were together, we looked at the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And, and I mentioned to you that Matthew, in, in chapter 14, verse 21, that Matthew only numbered the men. It's estimated that the amount of people that were ministered to on that day could have been as high as fifteen to 20,000 because women and children were not counted. And as I was looking at that, I, I gave to you basically three applications. And I want to begin with those applications by way of reminder. Uh, I would remind you that they took up 12 baskets full of fragments, which could serve as a reminder that we're not to take God's blessings for granted. And also, Matthew made it clear that they all ate and were completely filled. And the word filled means glutted or satisfied, totally satisfied. So we need to remember that the Lord is able to satisfy our deepest needs. I mentioned uh, rather Psalm 23, 5, where it says, My cup overflows. Psalm 22, verse, verse 26 says, The poor shall eat and be satisfied. 
Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. So they were completely filled. And then third, I pointed out that Jesus satisfies the hunger of all who come to him. It was impossible to feed the multitude with five loaves and two fish, but Jesus makes it possible because he's able to meet the need of any and all who come to him. It's like what he said in John 6, 35, when he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never go hungry. He who believes in me shall never be thirsty. And in verse 37 of the same chapter, he said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. So any who come to him will be satisfied by him. And so I was pointing that out to you last time we were together looking in Matthew. And so now Matthew is writing a continuation of the events that took place. And so in verse 22, it begins by simply saying, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, go before him, to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And so immediately after the events had taken place, he does something. He compels them. When it says that he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, the word um, uh, th that speaks concerning uh, making is a word that literally is urging or driving. It speaks of compelling. And Jesus compelled his disciples to get into the boat. Now, why would he compel them to leave? Well, we know that the apostles would fear for his safety and would not easily leave him by himself. As we've been going through Matthew, we looked at chapter 13, verse 57, and Matthew 13, 57 tells us that the people were offended at him. We know that death threats had been made against Jesus, and they may have been concerned for him, because all the way in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 18, it says, for this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And so they're already offended at him. They already desire to kill him. And so it's very possible that his apostles were fearing for his safety. We know that Herod was growing more interested in Jesus, and Herod was beginning to pose a threat to Jesus. Now, Herod, according to Luke 9, 7 through 9, Herod the Tetrarch heard about all the things that were going on. He was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. So we know that Herod was beginning to pose a threat to Jesus. And a third thing that we would note is that these men may have very well been in danger of being influenced by the multitude's reaction to his recent miracle. I point this out to you quite often, but it's something that I want you to always know and to always remember, and that is that you can be influenced by other people's opinions of Christ. And Jesus is well aware of that. Jesus is well aware of that. Because John was speaking concerning this and speaking concerning the miracle and in John's gospel, he records that they wanted to crown Jesus Christ as the king because he had fed them. You see in John 6, 14 and 15, how it says those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So because the Lord had fed them, they wanted to force him to become their king. You see, during that time, there was a very fierce nationalistic longing amongst many Jews. They wanted an anointed ruler who would lead them against the oppressive Romans. And what they did is they wanted to crown Christ so that he could lead them as well as provide for them. Well, Jesus saw it for what it was. It was a hindrance to his divine mission. The mission that he was sent on was to provide salvation. And he saw this as another temptation from the enemy because it would have been a way for him to get the kingdom without a cross. You remember how that Satan had said, all these kingdoms have been given to me and whoever I desire to give them to, I can give them. All you need to do is bow down and worship me and they'll be yours. And, and what he was promising Christ at that time was, was a, a crown without the cross. Well, this is another time that we see in Scripture where they wanted to by force make him into the king. And thus he's telling his disciples, you need to move on 
while he goes and he prays. So he orders them to leave according to verse 22 because he doesn't want his disciples influenced by the world system of leadership. We need to remember that God's kingdom is primarily spiritual in nature. In Romans 14, verse 17, it says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus wanted to teach his disciples that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. He wanted to remind them that in the system of the world, those who are great are called benefactors, and they have a tendency of taking advantage of their positions in order to cause other people to kowtow to them and to do the things that they require. So the model of leadership that Christ would have the church to understand is what is called servant leadership. That's why it says in, in Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45, that Jesus said, you know that in this world, kings are tyrants and officials lorded over the people beneath them, but among you, it should, not, it should be quite different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even I, the Son of Man, came here not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many. So the model of leadership is effective in all places leadership is needed. And so when you have a servant leader, servant leadership can be practiced in families and businesses, churches, and even in government. And so as Jesus sends away the disciples, he also dismisses the multitudes. And he had them go, according to verse 22, go before him to the other side. And so they're obedient to this command. They leave. And as they're leaving, verse 23, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening had come, he was alone there. And so it's interesting to note that Jesus went up to a mountain by himself to pray. Prayer is central to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when you read your Bibles, you might find this interesting. When you read your Bibles, uh, the disciples are never, ever recorded asking Jesus to teach them how to preach. Read your New Testament and see the various uh, interactions that take place between the men and Jesus. And not one time do you ever see one of the guys walking up to Jesus and say, can you teach me how to preach the message? Not once. You never see them asking, teach me to preach. They never come up to Christ and say, would you teach me the proper way of fasting? Can you teach me how to give? Can you teach me how to serve? You never even see them say, Jesus, teach us to love. But you do see them say, Jesus, teach us to pray. In Luke 11, verse 1, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And so they never asked, teach me to preach. Teach me how to, to fast, to give, to serve, to love. They never said that, but they did say, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Now, Jesus had a habit of prayer. It was the essence of his time of communion with the Father. He, he was sent to do the will of the Father. He had fellowship with the Father, and the Father was communicating with him, and that's how Jesus was, was moving along to do the work that God had called him to. As a matter of fact, his, his prayer life was so obvious that the disciples in Scripture often made comment or reference to it. You see it in Mark 1.35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Luke 5.16, he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Luke 6.12, one of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, spent the night praying to God. And so we all have people who see our lives. What is humbling is when you realize that if somebody were to be interviewed concerning the life of Pastor David, what do you see in his life? I wonder if they'd say he often withdrew to pray. Because Jesus did. Jesus went off to pray often, and so much so that his disciples saw this as an earmark, and that's what he's doing here. He's going off, and he's alone, and he's praying, and he's communing with the Father. Now, Jesus is real busy. 
he had little time to eat. We see in Mark 6.31 that just before he fed 5,000, it says in Mark 6.31, he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Jesus was very busy, so after the feeding of 5,000, and after the pressure to become king without a cross, and the enthusiasm of the crowd, well, naturally, he would withdraw and pray. More than likely, as he was praying, he would have been praying for his disciples, because again, that was, that was his habit. In John 17, 20, he says it, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their through their word. It was his habit to pray for his disciples, not only the 12, but he was also praying for us, those who would believe because of them. It's interesting how Hebrews 7.25 tells us uh, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus was praying then, he still prays for us now. And so he withdraws to pray. It says in verse 23, when evening had come, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. It's in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. John 6, 19 tells us that they had rowed, for, uh, they had rowed from three to three and a half miles into the Sea of Galilee. They're in the middle of the sea, and they're being tossed by waves because it says in verse 24 that the wind is against them. It's contrary. And according to verse 25, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. So the wind keeps pushing them farther and farther into the middle of the lake. They've been battling the wind and sea for at least nine hours. They must be incredibly tired, frustrated, helpless, and alone. They must have been at that point calling on the Lord, can you please help us? And they may have even had that question that many of us have had in the past, where's God when you need him? Dangerous and difficult situations often provoke us to begin to doubt the love of God. We can begin to question why he doesn't intervene and why he doesn't rescue us from our situations. And in the case of the disciples, they had seen Jesus Christ come to the rescue over and over again. Matthew recorded that Jesus had saved them when they were in a similar situation. We saw that in, in Matthew 8, 23 through 27, how that they were caught in a great storm. They were fearing for their lives while Jesus was asleep. They even awoke him and questioned his care for them. And Jesus stood up and stilled the storm. They must have been calling on the Lord to help them. Again, where is God when you need him? He most certainly must be aware of the trouble that they're in. In Psalm 38, 9, you know what I long for, Lord. You hear my every sigh. Psalm 130, verse 2, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Well, here's the thing. Jesus is aware of their situation. Mark tells us in chapter 6, verse 48, that he saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard, struggling against the wind and waves. He was aware of their situation. He hadn't forgotten them. His eyes were upon them, even when they didn't know it. My son David sent me a video yesterday it busted me up, busted me and my wife, Marie, up. It's a, it's a video of his son, David. My son, David, has a son named David. Makes it easy to remember. And so he sends us a video, and it's of my grandson, baby David. We call him baby David or little David. And uh, all you can see is this little guy. He's a year and a half or so. Little guy, all you can see is he's behind something, so you, you can't see his head, but you can't see his little body in his diaper. And you hear David, my son David's voice saying, baby David, what are you doing? He calls him Papa. Papa, what are you doing? What are you doing? And the baby's quiet. What are you doing? And the baby's quiet. He says, what are you doing? And the baby Pulls his head out, so now you see his little face, and he's got in his hand a cookie. <laughs> and he's hiding with the cookie, and then, then he hides again. He thinks that he's not being watched. And so David writes and says, a little sneaky guy. And I wrote back and he said, he's just like his dad. Because <laughs> my son did exactly the same thing, except he did it with ice cream. 
Same thing. So my prayer that I prayed has been answered. God, give my son David a son just like he was to me. <laughs> Teach him a lesson. And he has him, baby David. You know, but the thing is, little David, baby David, does not know that daddy's eyes on him. But daddy never takes his eyes off the baby. You see, there are stairs in where they live, and there's dangers that he's not aware of. And sometimes our kids, our babies, will be walking around, and they think they're in control of their environment, and they're not. They can wander around thinking that they're completely in control because their perspective is limited. Their experience in life is small. And so they've always been cared for, and thus they are very brave, and they'll go out and adventure, but they always do when a father's eyes are upon them. And I can still remember as a dad and now as a grandfather, I'm exactly that way. I still am that way. Just as last week, we were someplace with the grandkids and all, they were doing something, and, and, and I see one walk away carrying the other one, and, and my eye's on them. I keep an eye on them. Even when they don't know that somebody's eyes are on them, somebody's eyes are on them, and it's their father or their grandfather. That's how it is. And my father, my heavenly father, his eyes are on me. And I may be thinking I'm getting away with it. Look, at if I hide behind this sofa here, I can do this and he won't see me. That's not a fact. He sees me the same way that my David saw little David there hiding with his cookie. And sometimes a cookie can be a sin. Sometimes a cookie can be some, I delight in, it's what I want. Nobody knows I have it. I'm not supposed to have it. And we hide. We think nobody's watching us. Or sometimes it's because we're there and we're not even aware that we're being watched when we may be entering into danger. Here's the thing for you. Keep this in mind. We'll see this in a moment. I'm going to develop it further. You're never alone. There's never a time when God's eyes are not on you. Don't forget that. And it's not looking and say, let's see what this brat does so I can take a two by four and put him into a left field. No, because he loves you, his eyes are upon you. Keep that in mind. Because these men are at the point where they're thinking that they're all alone and that, that God doesn't know where they're at. But Jesus is aware of their situation. Again, Mark 6, 40, 48, he saw that they were in serious trouble. He hadn't forgotten them. In Psalm 139, verses 1 and 2, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my every thought went far away. He goes on in verses 15 through 17, You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They are innumerable. And so, as this is taking place, they don't know that the Lord's eyes are upon them. It says in verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out, for fear. It says when the disciples saw, the word saw means to look at intently. It means to stare or to be transfixed. Their eyes are firmly locked on this person walking across the water. Jesus acted at first as if he was going to walk past them. In the storm conditions, dark, misty, they didn't recognize him. On a spiritual level, in difficult times, that's what we also experience. When things are in chaos, we may very well think there's no help and God is just passing us by. And it appeared as if he was going to walk past them. Now, of course, he wasn't going to leave them in that situation. He intended to rescue them. What was he doing? He has given them opportunity to cry out for him for help that they might know that he cares and that he's able the Lord, by way of application, will allow us to find ourselves in a situation where we cannot help ourselves. And at that point, when we've got nothing that can save us, he allows it sometimes. You'll see this in a minute. He allows it sometimes so that we can see he can rescue us. Psalm 77, verse 1, I cried out to the Lord with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. 
Well, they thought it was a ghost, which was a common superstition of their day. But as they're beginning to cry out, verse 27, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. Immediately he spoke to them. He calmed them down. Take courage, I'm with you. Stop letting your fear direct your responses. Before he stills this storm, I want you to notice this. Before he stills the storm on the water, he needs to still the storm in their heart. And as all of this has taken place, when he says, be of good cheer, it's another way of saying, take courage. Peter, verse 28, answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Of all the men who heard the voice, it was Peter who spoke to the Lord. It was Peter who responded. Notice what he says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He's wanting to see whether this is really Jesus. Peter knew that Jesus could make it possible for him to do the impossible. If it is Jesus, then he can support his body on the water. Still, he's not going to take a step without God's command to do so. So Peter's overjoyed to see the Lord. His fears are momentarily vanquished by gratitude. So what does the Lord do? Well, verse 29, he said, come. Jesus is calming the hearts of the apostles and he's working in the life of Peter. He said, come. When Peter had come down out of the water, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. So what's interesting here is as this is taking place, the wind is blowing mightily against him. The waves are raising, they're beating against his body. His faith turns to fear. He begins to sink beneath the water. Somebody said his faith was enough to get him out of the boat, but it wasn't enough to keep him from sinking. Somebody wrote, my peculiar temptation has been constant unbelief. I know that God's promise is true. Yet does this temptation incessantly assail me. Doubt him, distrust him. He will leave you yet. I can assure you when that temptation is aided by a nervous state of mind, it is very hard to stand day by day and say, no, I cannot doubt my God. And so Peter in verse 30 prays the best prayer he could have prayed. It's only three words, Lord, save me. And what is Jesus' response? Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and pushed his head under the water and drowned him. That's how we think of the Lord sometimes. If you cry out to him, he's just going to drown you. That's where you can get when you're in a state of unbelief. That's where you can get when you begin, begin to believe the words of the enemy who whispers into your ear when you're going through your storm. And you can say, even if I cry out, he's not listening. Even if I ask for help, he never comes. Even if I need him at that moment, he rejects me. We sometimes can think that what he will do will press our head further down into it so that we end up drowning. But that's not how the Lord is at all. And I'm going to show you this in just a moment. I want to share with you some things to make this something that we can grab hold of. You see, the psalmist said in Psalm 40, verse 17, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh, my God, do not delay. Jesus instantly takes action but not without rebuke. He asks, why did you waver between faith and fear? It doesn't say that Peter didn't have any faith. He said that he had little faith. Why are you wavering? I called you into the water. I can sustain you as you walk on it. Wherever God guides, God provides. When, when God says, I am calling you to do this, though it's impossible, I'm going to allow you to see the possibilities that come through relationship with me. And so when God guides us, he provides for us. When Peter said, if it is you, call me, Jesus gave a one-word answer. He said, come. And here comes the apostle Peter doing the impossible because Christ made it possible. 
Now you can picture as this took place, he looks around, he sees the, the waves are rising, the wind is against him. He sees everything around him. He realizes, as we would, that I'm doing the impossible. There's no way that I can... What a, and so I, I would sink too. And it's interesting how the Lord reaches down and pulls him back up. And as he pulls him back up, I can almost see him put his arm on him and say, let's take a walk. And walks back to the boat. And as they're walking back to the boat, I wonder whether or not Christ Jesus was speaking more than the simple words that we find here, where he simply says to him, you're of little faith, why did you doubt? There may be other things that he spoke within his ear as he took him to that boat. But when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Now here we go. I want to develop something with you. I want to show you a few applications here applications to our own lives from this miracle. Let me share with you what I'm going to point to. One, we're going to see that Jesus sent them into a storm. Two, that he left them on their own. Three, that he watched over them. Four, that he came to their aid. And then fifth, that he gave them a teaching about faith and provoked them to worship. This is where I want to get real practical with you when it comes to this particular miracle walking on water. Let me share something with you that some of you perhaps may not realize yet, but you will. I want to first notice with you that he sent them into this storm. Notice what it says in verse 22. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. One, Jesus sent them into the storm. Now, that's contrary to much of what is taught today about God and his way of working with us. Many Christians think that after they're saved, everything is going to be smooth sailing. And they're taken by surprise when they enter into a season that is dark and painful. They're unprepared for real life. Sometimes you think if I go forward at that invitation or I raise my hand or I pray that prayer, from that point on, my whole life is going to be smooth sailing. I'm going to be just gliding in a straight path to the Lord. I'll never have a bad day again. Every morning I'm going to wake up and it's going to be sunny. Even if it's storming everywhere out, my backyard is going to be sunny and there will be birds singing in the trees at the window. And we can think that. We can think that, okay, I got right with the Lord, and now my marriage is going to be healed. I'm going to be, I'm now right with the Lord. My kids are going to follow God. I'm going to be right with the Lord, and the, the, the problems I've been having on, on the job are going to disappear. I've got right with the, God, the Lord. I'm going to receive a check in the mail to pay all my bills. We can think that way. We can think that, that I will never have another rough season in my life. And that's not true. There are times when the Holy Spirit is going to lead us right into a storm. And it happens. This is what took place with, with the Lord right here. We live in a time when a lot of people don't understand this. I don't know how to say this without it sounding kind of like just mean. But I'll say it in a way that hopefully it'll make some sense. We get our participation trophies, right? You played, you get a trophy. You bring it home, you put it on your mantle. I, we all came in first. Nobody came in first. We all came in first. Participation trophy. And we don't understand that to really win a race, you really have to discipline yourself. To really come in first, you, you need to work at it. But we don't realize, a lot of times we don't realize that in order to do what is great, requires sometimes a lot of pain. I, I've, I've spoken to and heard of young men, for example, who will say that they're going to go into the military. And they'll say, I'm going to go into the army and I'm going to be an army airborne or army ranger. Because it looks like it's easy, right? It does. It looks easy. So what are you going to do? Well, I'm going in the military. I'm going to be at the 82nd or whatever. Really? Yeah. And, and how are you going to be in the 82nd? Well, what, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sign up and they're going to give me jump wings. Really, they have no idea that not everybody makes it. They're not, they have no idea that you actually weed people out 
through having to do a lot of physical activity. And the first jump that I had in the 82nd, before I was in the 82nd, when I was going through training in Fort Benning, Georgia for airborne school, the very first jump that we had, 14 men broke their ankles and legs. That's what happens. Everywhere you go, you run. You'll run in the morning three miles, and after that, you run everywhere else for the next eight hours. You do that every day. It isn't something that's easy to do. You do three hours of PT in the morning, three hours of PT in the afternoon, and then you do other training. Not everybody makes it. But we have people today saying, all I need to do is sign my, my, my name on the dotted line. I'm going to be airborne. I'm going to be a ranger. I'm going to be special forces. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. I hope you make it, but it isn't that easy. It takes discipline. It takes strength. It takes determination. I remember a guy when we were going through jump school who went and put a tattoo on his arm. It was, it was a little devil. It was called Hot Stuff the Devil back then. They used to have hot stuff as an emblem. And he had parachute and he had jump boots. And he, in the first week of airborne training, he went and he had a tattoo of himself, of, of, of Hot Stuff the Little Devil, because he was going to be airborne. And he washed out within three days. He didn't make it. So I, he even bought jump boots. He never made it. Because it isn't that easy. But people think it is. And, oh, I signed my name, I'm going to. No, that's not how it works. If you want to succeed, it takes work and effort and discipline. And a lot of people don't understand that. They just say, well, that guy did it, I can do it. Maybe so, maybe not. Because you don't know what you're like until you're put in the fire. Then you discover what you can and cannot do. You can sit there watching this. You can watch video of it. You can say, I'm going to do that. That's one thing. But you put those boots on. You run those miles. You do that PT. You jump off that tower. You jump from that helicopter, and then you've made it. That's how it works. But we don't understand that. Everybody wants jump wings because they participated. And it doesn't work that way. There are times that they get disappointed, and they don't understand they don't understand what happened. They don't understand why they didn't succeed. They didn't understand the price or the cost. That's why Jesus said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. It's discipline. It's learning his lessons so that you can grow in the ways of the Lord and in one of the ways that God will, will raise you. And this is for those who want to grow. One of the ways that you will grow is once you discover God sends you into storms so that you can learn how faithful he is, no matter what. A.W. Tozer once wrote, God knows how long we can endure the night, so he gives the soul relief, first by welcome glimpses of the morning star, and then by the fuller light that signals the approach of the morning. Slowly, you will discover God's love in your suffering." Your heart will begin to approve the whole thing. You will learn from yourself what all the schools in the world could not teach you, the healing action of faith without supporting pleasure. You will feel and understand the ministry of the night, its power to purify, to detach, to humble, to destroy the fear of death and what is more important to you at the moment, the fear of life. And you will learn that sometimes pain can do what even joy cannot, such as exposing the vanity of earth's trifles and filling your heart with longing for the peace of heaven. God will send you into a storm so that you may learn that he is the Lord who delivers you from that storm. You will learn that. Jesus sent them into the storm, and we are sent into storms in order that we might put our dependence completely on him. You see, peace and prosperity are often the greatest pitfalls because faith is refined in adversity. In Psalm 66, verses 10 through 12, you, O oh God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You've caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. You allowed this so that you could bring us out and show us how great you are. He also, secondly, he left them alone in order to teach them that they are never alone. Listen, remember that we walk by faith and not by sight. He had left them alone. 
but they in reality were never out of his sight. Job 36 verse 7 says, He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous. Isaiah 43 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. He watched over them, and he was constantly aware of their danger. They were concentrating on rowing. He was concentrating on them. In storms, we learn that God is always vigilant, even when we think he doesn't care. Even when you're by yourself in your house or, or you're sitting in a, in a car and you've got your hands at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, you know that. I was in a uh, doctor's office I had years ago now and had to go and met with a, what, are, what, was called, what is called a neuropsychologist put through a battery of tests. I had lost my memory and was hospitalized in Miami, Florida for four days. And um, I had had some scans and it was, I was told that I needed to go and have a battery of tests. And so I went and had a battery of tests. And as I was there with the um, neuropsychologist who was giving to me these tests to see what was wrong with my memory. She told me that the things that I was suffering could possibly lead to dementia. I asked her, how long do I have? And she said, if you do everything you're supposed to do, seven years. That's when I was 58 years old. So I, I remember walking out of the, of the uh, doctor's office. I turned to Marie, who was there ne next to me, and I said, honey, take care of whatever paperwork and stuff needs to be taken care of. And, uh, and I went to the car. And I know the 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock position that you have on a steering wheel, because I had it. And I was gripping that steering wheel. And I started thinking, seven years. When I'm 65, I will have dementia. I won't remember my wife, my children, my family. It's all going to be gone. 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock. You've been there? Have you been there? Have you been there yet? You will be. Isn't that a happy thought? <laughs> That's a fact. That's life. Life's like that. What do you fall on? What strengthens you when you hear words like that? What strengthens you when you're told that your whole life is going to end in seven years? That you won't be the man that you used to be or the woman that you used to be in seven years? Marie took care of the bill, came out, sat next to me, didn't say a word. And I took it to the Lord. See, the doctor who had recommended that I go to this neuropsychologist had found on my brain, on both the left and right front temporal lobes, calcification. And he had said that that is what is going to have the onset, onset of, uh, of dementia. So I tell Marie, we just have to prepare for all of this. I meet with my children. I explain to them what's going on. I tell them that your dad's probably not going to be, if, if, if this doesn't, if nothing changes, then the father that you know right now isn't the father that you'll have in a few years. I told Marie, I said, I don't want you taking care of me. What I want you to do is put me in a home, a Christian care home. I don't want you to have to look at me like that. I want you to remember me as a strong man. It's very painful. Here it is. I shouldn't even tell you these things. Forgive me for the emotion. Have I been through storms? Yeah, I have. Have I had my hands on a wheel, 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, saying, what am I going to do? Yes, I have. 
Just this? No. Many times and many things. What have you learned? God will send you into a storm, but he delivers you out of it. I went. We took some time off. I came back. The doctor and I met, and he says, David, he says, I need to tell you, sometimes we make mistakes. There's nothing wrong with your memory. There's nothing wrong with your brain. I would, I, he showed me the x-rays. He showed me the calcification. He showed it to us. I would like to believe that I have been graciously treated by God to his hand of mercy. I do believe that. One way or another. One way or another. That's a fact. That's a fact. That's a fact. I, listen, if my memory would have gone, I'm good with Jesus any way you look at it. I am good with him. Please, please remember, some of you are, are not experienced in life enough yet or perhaps a bit young. You don't understand. Oh, pastor, you have no faith. I understand. I understand how you could think that, and I don't condemn you. But until you've been in that valley, until you've walked through it, until you've heard those words, probably is a good idea to reserve judgment because the Lord has to bring you through so you can say, and he does, my God is able, my God is able. And that's what he does, he brings you to that place. He brings you there. The Lord sent through, and he went through that season, that time of night, the Lord sent him into a storm in order that he would know that if he was walking through fire, he would not be burned, the flame would not scorch him because he was constantly watching him. In Psalm 121, verses three and four, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So as you're going through that, he comes to their aid. Like it says in Psalm 107, 28 through 30, they cry out to the Lord in their trouble. He brings them out of their distress as he calms the storm so that its waves are still. They're glad because they're quiet. He guides them to their desired haven. He comes to their aid in his time, and he teaches them to have faith in him. It says in verse 33, those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. And they worshipped him. They saw him for who he is. And that's what happens when you go through those times. You clearly see him because all the junk, all the debris, all the garbage is cleared out of the way. The things that you're occupied with right now that don't matter, they're cleared out of the way. The small things that occupy you sometimes, the things that you're concerned about, oh, they won't eat with me on the job site, oh, my neighbor's throwing his dog stuff into my backyard. The things that don't matter, I have to tell you, it's cleared out of the way. And the things that do matter remain right in front of you. And you see those things clearly and as a result, you are going to worship. And yes, you will say, you are the Son of God. We have seen what you've done. You walked on water, and you caused Peter to do so also. You saved him when he was sinking. You stilled the wind. You stilled the waves. This is evidence. You are the Son of God. Storms help to reveal who God really is, and they help to reveal what God can do. Remember that. Remember that. What I'm giving you today is called meat. I hope that you can digest it. That's what it is. Because some of you right now are saying, oh, come on, what a downer, man. I mean, with Jesus, it's always sailing. That's only because you don't read your Bible. Because when you read your Bible, you see that these things are common in the spiritual life because that's how God refines you. You've heard the term refiner's fire. This is how God refines you so that the things that don't matter are burned away, the things that do remain. And that's where you get the strong faith. You wanna have strong faith? You wanna have deep faith? You will go through deep things. You wanna have pure faith? You will be purified through the fire. That's the bottom line. And once that happens, you will come out of it and you will say, God was with me every step of the way. Every step. I didn't see it when it was happening because the only thing I could see was one step in front of me. 
But now I see he never left me, nor did he ever forsake me. Now I see the fruit of what happened, and I see the testimony that he's given to me and the strength that I have of faith in him because he did not leave me. And I can speak to you in that way. And I can say that you go through that tunnel, yes, but you come out of it. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I can say that. And that's what Christian faith is. And so they said, truly, you are the Son of God. And finally, when they, they crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, which was off to the west of this, the place called Capernaum. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all that surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched it were made perfectly well. They reached out to touch him, and we can do that today. People continued to come to him. They continued to reach out to him, and he continued to minister to them. And we can do that today. We can reach out to Christ and we can say, Lord, would you touch my life as I touch you? And finally, one thing I'd like to leave you with, it's this. It is always safer for you to be on the water with Jesus than in a boat without him. Keep that in mind. It's safer to be on the water with Jesus than in a boat without him. Peter did something that we sometimes mock. Oh, look at little faith. Where were the other apostles? Sitting in the boat. You can do it, Peter. <laughs> Sideline Christians. You can do it. Ah, oh, look, he sunk. Judas was taking bets, and Thomas was saying, I doubt if he'll do that. Keep that in mind, because what I just gave to you is a very important thought. It's safer on the water with Jesus than in a boat without him. Never forget that.